tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Cold, Season 3. Cherie Warren was a young mother looking for a fresh start. In the process of a divorce, she had moved out, found a great new job, and even found a new boyfriend. Life was finally looking up. But on a mild October evening after a long day at work, Cherie said goodbye to her co-workers, left the office, and was never heard from again. In season three of the hit true crime podcast, Cold, investigative journalist and host Dave Cauley digs into what really happened to Cherie. Follow Cold wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Prime members, you can binge the entire series ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about sinful sweets and parasites of Petricor. This episode, this episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're constantly growing and changing, hopefully growing anyway, changing most definitely. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Matt Martinek and Auden Johnson are voice talents Eric Peabody and Danielle Hewitt. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale of the evening is written by Matt Martinek and is performed by Eric Peabody. How much trouble can two friends get into working at a chocolate factory? We're about to find out. Now, without further ado, I present to you Mr. Chocolate. Ricky was one sick fuck, as was I. 
That's why we got along so well together. We first met at Addison's Chocolate in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He ran one of the grinders, I ran a conch mixer. It was just a job. Neither of us set out to work in chocolate. Hell, after working at that place for a few years, most people grew an aversion to chocolate altogether. It was cool, though, to know we were making such a beloved product that was consumed worldwide. Could have been much worse. We sat together at lunch every day. They gave us an entire hour to eat, which most people couldn't stand. I mean, who the hell needs an entire hour for lunch? We would have much rather had half of that so we could leave half an hour earlier at the end of the day, but we didn't make the rules. What that hour did afford, however, was the ability to get to know a person very well. I mean, figure it out. An hour a day, five days a week, close to 52 weeks in a year. That's about 260 hours of bullshitting a year about anything and everything. We did have some things in common. We were both in our mid-twenties, single, lived alone, and absolutely loved horror. Movies, books, comics, real-life serial killers. We just ate it up. It wasn't uncommon to be hit with a question like, what's your favorite kill from the Friday the 13th series? Which, in case you were wondering, I answered with the sleeping bag against the tree scene, of course. Or, who's your absolute favorite serial killer? Mine's a toss-up between Bundy or Kemper, depending on my mood. Those types of topics let us pass the time with ease. Our workstations were right next to each other, so it was easy to hear each other over the hum of the machines. So, Dave, serious question. Ricky looked puzzled, deep in thought. What's that? I had an idea it might be a good one. Ed Gein. Do you think he was mentally disabled, or do you think he understood what he was doing? Especially with the wearing of the skin and such. Oh, definitely mentally ill. Just a simpleton who missed his mommy and snapped out. I'd actually contemplated this before, I think he just wanted to have that closeness with a female. Hence the titty vest, nipple belt, and a shoebox full of pussies. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. He definitely had his ideas. That's why he's not a favorite of mine. He didn't have a solid plan or have his shit together enough to get away with anything long term. Ricky shook his head in disapproval. About a year or so into our friendship, Ricky started to miss work. A lot. Usually a day every week. I didn't think much of it since I knew Ricky liked to party. I wanted to keep his company at work, so I did inquire. He seemed a little surprised that I did. Well, Dave, I didn't really want to tell you about this, but I'm working on something at home. It's kind of taken a lot of my time. It's my pet project. Ricky was smiling ear to ear as he quietly divulged this info. What the hell is it? Are you making something? And why the fuck are you whispering? Uh, please tell me it's not a fucking bomb or something. I was honestly intrigued. Christ, Dave, keep it down. And no, it's not a bomb. Definitely artsier than that. I can't really explain it here. You gotta see it for yourself. I mean, if you are truly interested. Ricky was sneering devilishly. Fuck yes, of course. With that look you got on your face, now I gotta see it. I laughed as I said it. Dave, one more thing. Can I trust you? His face became serious and stern, and he stared me right in the eyes. I nervously nodded my head, and we went back to work. I was no longer sure I should have opened that can of worms after all. It was the Friday after I had approached Ricky about his absence, and Ricky thought it was finally time to show me this project he had been working on. He insisted on having a few drinks beforehand, so we went to a local bar after work. We both got pretty hammered within a few hours, as neither of us would ever shy away from a drink. I was more of a vodka guy, and he was more whiskey. We went shot for shot until he decided it was time for this 
unveiling, as he called it. I didn't really know what I was in for, but I followed Ricky to his house, not wanting to be looked at as some pussy. As we arrived, I could see why Ricky was a bachelor. His house was small, dilapidated, and messy as fuck. Junk everywhere. I would have tidied up a little, but you know how it is. He pulled me by the arm before I could be too critical. He led me to a door at the end of the hall, which was closed shut. We stopped at the door. Ricky looked at me. Are you sure? I wasn't sure at all, but I nodded the affirmative anyway. He pulled a key from his jeans pocket, unlocked the door, and opened it slowly. What I saw was amazing. A huge black desk stood there, shimmering like polished obsidian, with four life-sized skulls on top of it in an arc shape. They were glowing purple as Ricky had installed a black light above the display. Holy fuck! Ricky, that's badass! I was impressed. Where'd you get those skulls? They look so realistic. This is the altar I've made. It's a work in progress, though. Much more to come. Ricky spoke these words with confidence and pride. What more are you going to do? Put up some inverted crosses and shit? That would look killer. I noticed Ricky was looking down at the floor as I spoke to him. More skulls, more bones, but it's just so hard to find these girls and taking them apart's a bitch. That's what takes up real time, and getting rid of the rest is difficult. Ricky raised his eyes to mine, expecting a response. I waited a little and then burst out laughing. I wasn't falling for it. Har har har, you sick bastard. I moved towards the skulls and took one in my hands. As I lifted it, a tooth fell out onto the floor. As I heard it hit, with a clink, my heart fell and I instantly got sick to my stomach. I was not prepared for it. Not at all. Fuck, Dave, be careful. Now I gotta glue that thing back in there. You gotta be gentle with them. They're not toys. This guy was for real. I set the skull back on the desk and sat on the floor. I didn't know what else to do, next to the tooth. I was frozen for a moment, thinking about what to do. I was disgusted, but I was somewhat excited at the same time. This was the big time. No fucking around. Ricky was living it every day of his life. I know it's a lot to take in, Dave, and you can walk away if you want, I understand. But I've been thinking. I could use your help. We could do it together, our own special thing. And we've studied it. We could be great. Ricky's excitement was growing as he laid it out for me. Jesus Christ, I can't believe it. This is insane. I was losing it. I started to rock back and forth and hyperventilate. I don't know if I can do it. Ricky helped me to my feet and walked me out of the room. There's one more thing I need to show you, Dave. You have to see it. He took me to his cellar door, and when he opened it, the stench of death overtook me. I instantly vomited all over Ricky's kitchen floor. It was as if a hundred dead animals were decomposing down there, rotting. It's okay, Dave. Get yourself together. You will get used to the smell, but for now, put this on. It'll still be bad, but it'll help. Ricky handed me a respirator, and I gladly strapped it on. Ricky guided me by the arm into his basement. My heart beat faster with every stair we descended. For a moment, I thought I was having a fucking heart attack. Part of me wanted to run, and part needed to see. And I saw, all right. There she was, some nameless woman, ripped apart 
in pieces amid a dismantling of epic proportions. Her head was resting in a massive pool of blood on an old wooden table. One eye was already torn out, exposing the empty, blackened socket. The other eye was wide open and staring at me, and it looked as if the eyelid was completely removed. The blood-soaked hair was resting beside it, stringy and gluey and still attached to the scalp. Her deflated, wet-looking breasts were on the floor next to the chair, looking shrunken and bluish, the brown nipples so small they were almost non-existent. Black flies encircled the pieces of the poor woman. I looked away. It took a while to get into the swing of things, but, as with anything, we desensitize and we adapt. Ricky was the mastermind. I was just his wingman and disposal assistant. I refused to kill anyone. It wasn't in me to do such a thing. But after that, anything was fair game. I became an expert at the bone saw. A person has absolutely no idea how much force it takes to get a human body apart. The sinew, the muscle, the bone, it really is an art form. And even after the fact, we still had to clean the bones and bleach the skulls, which were not quick processes. It literally took days to take care of one corpse. No wonder why Ricky was missing so many days of work. Weeks turned into months, and the women of Milwaukee were in an absolute fucking panic. Ricky tried to snag one every two weeks or so, sometimes with success. As the panic spread, the women got a little warier of Ricky's pickup tactics at these bars. Sometimes he would come home empty-handed, and we would just get drunk and work on our altar, maybe playing some video games afterwards. And, as we went along we did decide to experiment a bit. The first part that we chucked into the copo grinder was a decomposed eyeball. Ricky threw it in nonchalantly as I was acting as the lookout. We were giddy as it was chewed up and disappeared into the bean grains altogether. Not a fucking trace. The next day, it was the tip of a pinky finger. Same result. We started to bring a pocket full a day to work. Teeth, hair, fingernails, pieces of skin, anything small that we would love to see made into a candy bar of some sort. To think, someone in Europe could be snacking on a chocolate-covered eyeball, or someone in Scandinavia could be chewing on a milk chocolate toenail. It gave a strange, sick satisfaction to both of us. Seeing how many body parts we could send out the factory's door for human consumption was a challenge. This went on for months, and the cool thing was, it had never been done before. Unless I just hadn't heard of it, that is. The altar we were constructing was truly something to behold. It was a shame we had to keep it a secret between us because its grandiosity, however morbid and severe was truly befitting of a museum. We used whatever we could of the bodies, but the bones were the most important parts and the bulk of the display. Skulls, arms, and legs were the easiest to work with. We dabbled with hands and feet, but the fingers and toes had to be wired together for support, which was just a pain in the ass. All of the unused pieces were either buried in the forests of Wisconsin or melted in acid but it was worth it. The altar was a monstrosity that ended up swallowing the entire room. The skulls were the centerpiece, of course, but we had the arms set up so that they reminded me of dragon's wings, flaring out from each side of the table, from the floor to the ceiling. We were up to 13 bodies. 13! And then, out of the blue, it happened. A little girl from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania bit into a fucking toe bone right in the middle of her chocolate bar. I guess the grinder wasn't as foolproof as we thought. Obviously, this was a big fucking deal. Huge. We had made a mistake. 
The toe incident was all over the press, with video of the poor girl and her pissed off parents talking about it on the news and showing off the bone on camera. The authorities knew exactly where to go to find out what the fuck was going on, too, as we were the only plant that supplied these bars. Within a day, they were knocking on the front door of Addison's Chocolate. All the workers were sent home, the factory was shut down, and Ricky and I were scared to absolute fucking death. We knew it was just a matter of time before they put the pieces together, and all we could do was try to keep our cool as best as possible. We made a pact to stay away from each other, and Ricky said he would begin to dismantle the altar. Meanwhile, forensic experts were inside the factory, emptying every grinder and every conch, getting ready to test for any traces of human remains. I was honestly formulating a plan to commit suicide when it came on the news that Ricky had turned himself in. I couldn't fucking believe it as his photo popped up on the screen. He confessed to every single thing. Took the blame entirely on himself. Didn't mention me at all. It's crazy how things work out sometimes. Every employee at Addison's had to make a statement to the police, which I also agreed to. I said I knew nothing of Ricky's exploits or his double life. I said I barely knew him at all, in fact. A part of me felt terrible that he took the whole damn thing upon himself, but then again, I think maybe that's exactly what he wanted all along. When all was said and done, Ricky had 13 bodies under his belt, no small feat, and became forever known as Mr. Chocolate. And the altar, he left it for the authorities to dismantle. I'm glad someone else got to see it and appreciate what we did. I think of Ricky often, as well as the adventures we had. Strangely, I wouldn't change a thing. I hope you enjoyed Mr. Chocolate, as written by Matt Martinek and voiced by Eric Peabody. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. It seems like every day you learn something new about yourself, doesn't it? One day you're a cat person, the next you're a dog person. One day you're a Methodist, the next you're a Presbyterian. One day you're a male escort, the next you're hosting a horror anthology podcast. Yeah, life can take you in all sorts of directions. In any case, getting to know yourself is an ongoing process and you function a whole lot better when you stay on top of it. If you've ever spent weeks, months, or even years thinking, what do I really want? you know exactly what I mean. That's why it's so beneficial to be able to talk things out. Not with yourselves, we've seen how helpful ourselves are, but to someone who can really help. Someone qualified, someone licensed to do just that. For example, a licensed professional therapist from BetterHelp Online Therapy. Just imagine the advantages. BetterHelp has the perfect therapist just waiting to help you on your personal journey of self-discovery. Wouldn't it be nice to have some professional input on the decisions you make? Some objective insight on how you view the world? If you've ever felt unsure about things, even uncomfortable in your own skin, a therapist is exactly the help you need. It's like having a handrail along your personal path through life. If you've never tried therapy, take it from me. It's a boon to your success. You know what they say about two heads being better than one, right? Well, I can vouch for that personally. Contrary to popular belief, my own head is not infallible and my own therapist has saved me quite a few bumps and bruises. He's like a helmet when it comes down to it. He's taught me stuff like positive coping skills and setting boundaries, discovering what you really want and taking the right steps to get there. It all empowers you to be the best version of yourself and why would you want it any other way? With BetterHelp, it's easier than ever to get started. 
Fill out a simple online questionnaire and you'll be matched with the perfect therapist within 48 hours. From then on, you can text your therapist anytime and receive prompt, thoughtful advice. Every week, you can schedule video chats or phone calls, whichever you're more comfortable with. Point is, you're no longer on your own. You get all the time-proven benefits of therapy without setting foot in an office. No driving, no waiting, no being forced out of your element. And best of all, it's affordable. With BetterHelp, the help you need is quick, easy, and convenient. You wouldn't ride a bike without a helmet, would you? Why would you live without a therapist? You've got a life's potential to fulfill, listener. Let's keep the rubber on the road. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Our very own Eric Peabody can be found over on his show, Horror Hill, airing Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time in both podcast and YouTube format. Be sure to check him out. Our second tale of the evening comes to us from author Auden Johnson and is performed by Danielle Hewitt. Nida Lance knew the strange stories surrounding her favorite forest. She never experienced them until a stone altar appeared in the middle of the woods. She left it alone, yet something followed her anyway. Without further ado, I present to you Dark Memories of Her Forest. Beautiful silence. The kind you only found in the middle of the woods. Nita Lance felt alive again. The week had been a chore. Recently, all her days were a struggle toward the weekend. She finally had time and money to go away and hike instead of settling for day trips. She'd been living lean for a month to afford the cabin, but this would be worth it. She was deep enough in the woods to ditch all reminders of life outside. No casuals talking louder than necessary. The forest had a strange kind of energy. It only appeared when you were alone and silent. It held a kind of atmosphere that fueled the imagination. Sunlight shone through the leafy canopy, turning ordinary rocks and trees into glowing treasures. Nita slowed down her pace to fully appreciate the magic. This was home. The forest had opened its door and rolled out a welcome mat of bright autumn leaves. It prepared a table full of tranquility and acceptance. Loneliness had been her painful acquaintance, but not here. Nita spun, fanning her trekking poles like they were a billowing dress. She looked foolish, but it didn't matter. Her dog danced around her too used to her nonsense. Nita stopped spinning and smiled at him. Thorn looked up as if he sensed her gaze. Nita enjoyed the quiet, but she also liked the reminder that she wasn't completely alone. Fifty pounds with a fierce growl. Thorn helped her feel comfortable while exploring the mountains on her own. A fallen tree cut off the path forward. The white trail marker glowed on the other side. This was new. Granted, she hadn't been here in two weeks. Stones were stacked in piles of twos and threes across the tree's trunk and the ground in front of it. The rocks were all about the size of a fist or smaller. They didn't form any particular shape, though some appeared to be figures. Too high to step over without disturbing the scene. Cold fingers walked up her back. Nita snapped her head behind her. Wind still danced but made no sounds as it blew through the leaves. Birds had been chattering above, but that too had stopped. Were they watching her? waiting for something to happen. Dread wrapped arms about her legs. Shadows didn't hold monsters. Grass didn't conceal beasts waiting for a chance to attack. Human-like creatures didn't tap on trees to lead silly hikers into a trap. She never fully believed those stories, but they grew life inside of her mind nonetheless. She'd been coming here for months, 
and never experienced anything unusual. Thorn relaxed beside her, tongue out. He wagged his tail when she looked at him. Nita scratched behind his head. Scaring herself miles from civilization wasn't wise. She needed to keep moving. How was she supposed to continue walking? Nita read enough myths and legends to know to never touch a creepy altar in the woods. Of course, this must have a logical explanation. But that didn't stop her from jumping at the small rustling behind her. Thorn sniffed at the closest stone pile, one shaped like a person pointing a small arm. She didn't enjoy walking too far off the path, especially when she wouldn't be able to see the ground. The grass wasn't as overgrown on the right side. Nita guided Thorn around. A small cross made of branches sat upright near the end of the fallen tree. She would have missed it if she hadn't been examining the ground for critters. Thorn sniffed the cross with a pained whine. She pulled his leash to keep moving. He planted his 50 pounds on his hind legs and wouldn't budge. Come on, Thorn. Grass rustling screamed into the unnatural silence. The wind hadn't picked up. She'd come across thumb-sized bugs that sounded as large as squirrels when crawling around the forest floor. Nita didn't care for those insects, but they were harmless at least. But this sounded like leaves breaking under footsteps, casually strolling to their destination. Thorn stood. He faced the rustling, wagging his tail as though welcoming an old friend. He released a happy yelp as he allowed Nita to lead him away. Leaves bent and flew, but she didn't see an approaching hiker. Thorn kept looking back as they rounded the tree and continued down the trail. What are you seeing? He looked up at her, but of course, said nothing. The relaxing sounds of crickets singing and birds chattering returned, still not loud enough to drown out the footsteps from the invisible hiker. The rustling stopped when they did. It moved when they did. She turned each time but saw nothing. Thorn wasn't on edge. He was good with strangers but not overly friendly with them. He'd at least acknowledge if someone was following them. Thorn trotted down the trail as if this was a normal day. Nita wouldn't say she was afraid. Cautious, but not scared. If anyone asked, she'd never be able to explain this feeling. She knew whatever was behind them didn't mean them any harm. Still, she was happy when they reached the trailhead. The rustling stopped as soon as they left the woods. Thorn turned as though someone had called him. He wagged his tail but kept walking. It'll make a good story at least. Thorn tilted his head as they strolled to their cabin. The setting sun turned the landscape a calming blue. Cabins were spread far enough apart to give each visitor their privacy, but close enough that she could run to her neighbor if she had trouble. The distance protected her from the noise, but not by much. Night was fully on them and her neighbors blasted music loud enough to shake the forest. She couldn't escape it, even out here. She never understood why people brought their noise all the way to the middle of the forest. The racket became a hammer as it slammed against her head repeatedly. She couldn't sleep. She complained to the front desk, but they said no one was staying there. She insisted. They called about 30 minutes later to tell her that they checked, but heard and saw nothing. The noise continued. Maybe it came from somewhere else. The music, the loud chatter, the night creature's calls. They all stopped as though choked off shortly after midnight. The grass rustling was almost a welcome sound. It strolled to her cabin. Thorn perked up his head but didn't move or growl. The porch lights came on as the rustling stopped at her door. Her dog remained relaxed by her side. Nita crept across the cabin. Boards groaned under her weight. She shifted the front door blinds enough to peek out. A shadow stood at the base of her stairs. She couldn't make out any features. It looked as if darkness had taken on a human shape. It shrank as it sat on her steps. She should have been afraid, but all she felt was protected. 
Thorn stood beside her, wagging his tail at the shadowed figure. Tap, tap, tap. It came from the kitchen. Tap, tap, tap. Thorn growled. The shadow figure shifted. She hadn't closed the kitchen blinds. A face pressed against the window with impossibly large eyes and a smile spread far too wide. Fear wrapped strong fingers around her lungs, but calm one. She was safe. As long as she stayed in the cabin with the shadow figure out front, she was safe. The sharp nail tapped a steady rhythm against her window. Thorn's deep bark rolled through the cabin in her bones. The thing's wide eyes narrowed in anger, but its smile never fell. The tapping became urgent. It was begging to be allowed entrance. The call tried to coax bones and muscles to move. Her body wanted to open that window. Her eyes couldn't turn away from that captivating smile. Thorn's bark kept her grounded. The shadow figure appeared in her cabin between her and the creature. The thing's tapping was almost frantic in its desperation and anger. Then, it was gone. Thorn growled, but fortunately, stayed at her side. The shadow figure returned to the porch. It remained there until sunrise. People told particular stories about this mountain, about spirits and demonic growls, strange knockings, no disappearances as far as she knew. Only tales of hikers experiencing unexplainable phenomena. Nita had learned this after her hiking trips became a regular occurrence. Nothing had ever happened to her. She didn't believe in the supernatural, but she had a healthy fear and fascination with it. You heard and saw unexplainable things in the forest. Nita had felt no reason to be more cautious than usual while alone on the trail. A sane person would have packed their bags and left at sunrise. They wouldn't have taken a nap, then ventured out onto the trail alone again. They wouldn't have tried to find the strange stones in the cross again. The tree and the rock piles were gone, with no evidence that anything had ever obstructed the path. Gravel crunched close behind her, but no one was there. Nita always thought she had a normal reaction to things. As the invisible footsteps approached, again, she didn't feel afraid. Did you protect me last night? She asked as the steps stopped. Silence was her answer. She was alone in the middle of the forest with an invisible person. She hadn't passed anyone for miles. Getting to civilization would take at least a few hours. Thorn stretched the leash as far as it would go. He sniffed empty air. The fur on his head and back moved as though someone was petting it. Thorn wagged his tail. Nita resisted dragging him back to her side. She didn't want to startle whatever was with them. Thorn, come here. He trotted back to her. She tipped her head to the spirit and tried not to run down the trail. Like yesterday, it followed her until she was out of the forest. This time, she heard more than one set of footsteps. Nita always unplugged as much as possible when hiking, but this time she made an exception. Finding stories about the mountain was fairly easy. She examined each of them for any information about ghosts following people on the trail. She found nothing. All the paranormal incidents happened when people hiked or camped at night. Nita wandered past her neighbor's cabins, both of which appeared empty. She peeked into the windows but saw no signs of life. Maybe they both packed this morning while she was asleep. But the person at the front desk said last night that no one had been there. None of the stories mentioned that kind of noise. She returned to her cabin. The music and loud chatter started again shortly after nightfall. Someone must have had a late check-in. She didn't bother calling the front desk. Would these people go silent like everything else later that night? The footsteps approached her door. She peeked out the window. Nita couldn't be certain, but the same shadow figure sat at her steps. 
Maybe it could talk in that form. Why are you here? She asked through the door. They descend the mountain some nights. The voice sounded like it came from farther than the front porch. She couldn't tell the age or gender. Why are you protecting me? Sometimes. I'm tired of seeing innocent people die. Those stones. It marked you. But I didn't touch them. Someone did. All suffer because of it. Is the forest safe? Only during the day. She shouldn't have so easily believed the shadow figure in its tale of the forest. A normal person would convince themselves it was all a dream. A normal person wouldn't have stayed a second night after the incident yesterday. The same eerie silence crawled across the forest. Then howls of pain echoed through her cabin. Cries found only at the scene of a massacre. The voice's agony turned physical as they burrowed inside of her. She could practically feel their torment. An inhuman growl followed. She reached for the phone, but the shadow figure stood in her path. There is no one to save, it said. What did it mean? It couldn't expect her to do nothing while people were being tortured. Nita called the front desk. Once again, they told her she didn't have neighbors. They stuttered their response. Their insistence was almost a plea for her to stop calling. They knew. The person hung up before she could question them further. What if this wasn't a ghost? The voices sound too strong to be spirits. What about that growl? She had to do something. Nita grabbed her flashlight out of her bag. It's unwise to go out at night. Nothing but bad memories are outside, the shadow said. Thorn, come, she said at the door. He didn't move from his spot on the couch. His ears twitched at the sounds, but was otherwise calm. A knock that shook the door startled her heart into her throat. Thorn was beside her with a growl. Grass rustled outside from what sounded like several people. They all stopped at her cabin. Shadows passed her curtains. Eyes peered in through naked windows. Please help us, the voices begged. Her body seized as her entire being rejected their cries. They sounded normal, hurt. So why was she struck with an overwhelming desire to flee? Please. A voice came from behind the cabin. Thorn barked so loud she almost didn't hear the plea. For that, she was grateful. Nita found herself grabbing his collar and backing closer to the shadow figure. What are those? Memories. Something slammed against her window so hard she thought it would break. Why aren't you helping us? The spirit at the window demanded in a far less appealing voice. Thorn pulled at her as though driven to tear apart whatever was outside. They will leave soon, the shadow said. They cannot enter. The voice faded with the sunlight. She didn't linger. She was packed before sunrise and in her car as soon as the shadow assured her that they were gone. Nita stayed away from the mountain for months after that. She hiked other places, rented cabins on quiet mountains. But nothing could replace the special kind of calm she felt in her forest. Nature itself was cleansing, but her forest left her feeling strong enough to knock down anything in her path. The pull consumed her. She returned. She almost laughed at the staggering difference. She almost wept for how much she missed this place. The footsteps were eager behind her. The rocks appeared every now and then. She warned other hikers about them. She didn't mention the spirits. She encouraged them to leave the rocks alone. Nita never stuck around to see if they did. She was always out of the forest by sunset. Maybe people were right. They said she was weird. They said she was alone because something about her seemed to repel others. She tried being normal, but it felt as if she was wearing clothes that were too small. People would come later, she hoped. 
At that moment, she had Thorn in her forest. I hope you enjoyed Dark Memories of Her Forest, as written by Auden Johnson and performed by Danielle Hewitt. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Cold Season 3. Good news, everyone. Just when you thought it was chilly enough, the Cold Podcast is back, now in its third season. Cold is a true crime podcast series by investigative journalist and host Dave Cauley. And in season three, he's tackling the cold case of Cherie Warren, a young mother who disappeared back in 1985. Cherie was a 25-year-old woman in the middle of a divorce and hoping to start anew. With a new place, a new job, and a new boyfriend, things seemed to be on the upswing. But one day after work, Cherie said goodbye to her co-workers and she was never heard from again. Supposedly, she was off to give her ex-husband a ride, but according to him, she never showed up. But the ex-husband turned out to have a checkered past, to say the least, having lured another woman into the mountains where he beat her with a tire iron. Could he be responsible for her disappearance? Needless to say, all eyes were on him. Meanwhile, though, there was another man in the picture. Cherie's new boyfriend, a former reserve police officer, turned out to have a history of sexual violence. Two men, neither one a choir boy, one who swears he loves her, and the other who seems not to care, and the woman who connects them disappears into the dead of night. Could one of them be responsible for her disappearance? Could one of them have murdered her? Listen to the new season of Cold to uncover the truth about what happened to Cherie. And while you're at it, dip into seasons one and two. It's the perfect show for all you true crime fanatics. Type thecoldpodcast.com into your browser for a video preview of what you can expect in season three. It's a pretty compelling case, and I totally recommend it. In fact, I think you're going to be the one to finally solve this thing. So do us all a favor and get on it, huh? I mean, Dave Cauley's good, but he can't do it all by himself. Follow Cold wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Prime members, you can binge the entire series ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Danielle Hewitt's work can be found here on our very own network, as well as over on the Creepy Podcast. Check her out and be sure to let them know Steve from Chilling Tales for Dark Nights sent you. On that note, be sure to check out the other shows we offer on our network. We have Horror Hill, airing Thursdays for your hardcore, more brutal offerings. Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. Fear from the Heartland airs Wednesdays. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has a show on Sunday nights that features two stories on the Standard Edition, as well as two more which can be accessed through our patrons area. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams dreams. <laughs>
chilling tales for dark nights. Chilling tales for dark nights.